I love that song. I don't know about you, but it gets me dancing in the morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thoughts and Coffee. We are now on episode 101 because last year, we, uh, last year, last year, last week, <laughs> we celebrated our 100th episode with everybody in the community and just want to give a big shout out to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I'm the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain as well as Blended. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without our sponsors. So Emerge is proud to partner with Thoughts and Coffee to elevate our combined focus on empowering and growing meaningful relationships in the freight industry. The first and only freight-specific RFP platform emerges reinventing freight procurement by offering solutions that enhance the spot and contract procurement process, enabling shippers to make the most strategic decisions possible, saving invaluable time, and enhancing productivity. Learn more at EmergeMarket.com forward slash thoughts and coffee. So we are back here. I mean, it is another snowy day in Toronto. Can I tell you it's snowing for like the 55th time, I think, this winter. I'm done with snow. I don't know about all of you, but I'm definitely done with snow. And I'm only a week back from California. So that is saying a lot. But going back to our 100th show from last week, I do want to give a shout out. Because as you know, we were giving a giveaway of some Let's Talk Supply Chain swag to those who shared the post of Thoughts and Coffee of our 100th episode, tagged some people. And so just want to give a shout out to Steve Vick, John Baglino, Demo Perez, Jerry Robletto, and Imran Yunus. Thank you so much for participating and for sharing the show, commenting, being part of it, tagging people. I think it was John and Jerry that's getting the Let's Talk Supply Chain polo shirt. Um, Steve Vick. Oh, no, Jerry's getting one of the purchasing shirts. Anyways, we're going to see pictures from them because they're going to take pictures when they get the swag, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We also, in the name of the 100th episode, we also donated $200 to Blended GoFundMe page, and we're going to put that up for you as well in case you want to make an impact and see more diversity on industry stages because that is what we're doing with Blended. Now, let's talk about what is happening with Let's Talk Supply Chain this week. So this week's episode episode is with R2 Logistics. And we talk all, I mean, logistics is a really, really important part of all of our supply chains right now, especially, obviously, with, you know, prices going up, capacity issues. Now there's a current shutdown again in China, which is going to affect this quite substantially again. Um, and so this is really a timely epi episode. So if you don't know who R2 Logistics is, go and listen to this episode. It's episode 251, wherever you subscribe to the show. And you can see on there, we've got Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Player, Player FM, Amazon. So wherever you subscribe to the show, it's episode 251. Uh, plus, you can go and check that out over on letstalksupplychain.com as well. Next, we have events that are coming up. So if you missed it, DC was live last Friday with Action Items and she had Sophia on the show and they had a really great conversation. So I'm going to show you where you can go and do a playback, but she does go live every second Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. And then of course, we've got No Bullshipping with Hope White. That one is coming up, not this Friday, but next Friday. Um, I don't know who her guest is, but always a really, really great show. So make sure to tune into that. We've got Log Tech Live with Eric Johnson happening the first Friday of every month. And then of course, first things first with Rob Garrison of Mercado as well. And he's talking about the first mile. And actually his last um, episode was all about investments in supply chain. So if you're a supply chain startup, you might want to go and check that one out. And I'll show you in just a second where you can do that. We've got Coming In Hot with Abby Baird. That 
that is coming up over the next couple of weeks as well. So that kind of does it for the events that are coming up. What else do we have? Oh, this is what I wanted to show you. So over on the Let's Talk Supply Chain YouTube page, if you have not gone there yet, head over there and this is where we have all of our shows. So if you missed any of the live shows that we have, we've created a playlist for you for each and every one of them, along with the description so you can go and check out which one you want to go and listen to and watch. We've also got a new... Um, video series with Apex Logistics talking about different industry verticals as well. So you might want to go and check that out. Um, and then this week, we've got a new episode of Blended coming out. I cannot wait for you guys to hear that. We're going to have the applications for the Blended Pledge, hopefully available by April. And so we're going to be, we're going to start to see and start to give away grants to diverse voices so that they can say yes to industry speaking events, which I am extremely excited about because there's so many amazing voices in this industry and we want to make sure that we can provide the financial support so that they can say yes and so that it doesn't come out of their pocket and they're not worried about that part of saying yes to a speaking engagement. Anyways, so that's what we're doing at Blended and that's what's happening at Let's Talk Supply Chain. I'm so glad to be back with you today. And now I'm going to introduce our guest for today. So Brad, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey everyone. Hey sir. How are you doing? Thanks for having good, me on. Good, good. All the way from, I think you said Phoenix, Arizona, right? Yeah, Scottsdale. So it is a. It's going to be a balmy, almost ninety degrees today. So my apologies for the uh, the snow in Canada today. Brad, seriously, he's like, I'm going to come <laughs> on here and I'm going to make her feel bad about the snow that she's watching outside her window right now. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brad. Thanks a lot. No, I'm very happy that you are in warm weather because I would like to be in warm weather right now. So for everybody who's watching, give us an introduction. Tell us who you are, what you do, um, and, you know, day in the life, Brad. Yeah, so really excited to be on today. Uh, my name is Brad Bloomstrom. I'm the uh, Chief Financial Officer uh, at Emerge here. I've uh, been with the company about two years. And uh, if you know anything about Emerge, uh, founded by a couple of serial entrepreneurs in the supply chain space. So I've known the Lettos, you know, going back close to a decade now, back to their days founding Global Trans, which is a big uh, freight brokerage based here, actually not too far up the road uh, in Scottsdale. Um, so I got to know them, you know, through the experience through that. And then another startup called 104 Systems that Andrew was involved in, our founder, um, and then came on board here when we really started growing, you know, about two years ago. Um, so it's been really exciting. Um, and very excited, obviously, to be on the show here today and uh, be able to partner with Thoughts of Coffee here. Yeah, we're excited to have you on here. Just want to give a quick shout out to Melanie and John over on my personal LinkedIn. We've already got some chatter going on in the comments on the Let's Talk Supply Chain LinkedIn page. Everybody is happy to be here saying hi to each other. And we've got Anna with us this morning. I haven't seen Anna in such a long time, um, but it's really great to see all of you here with us this morning. So thank you so much for that introduction. I've been learning more and more and more about Emerge. I really love your culture and everything that you're all about. We did a podcast episode. So if anybody's looking for more information on Emerge, go and check out that podcast episode because we do a bit of a, di a deep dive into what exactly it is that you do. So before we get to the articles, we always talk about our poll of the week. So last week, our poll was, do you drink coffee? Easy question, right? <laughs> really simple, really easy. And everybody kind of thought the same thing because we had 1,646 votes. We still have one week left on this thing. Who, who are these 17%? I don't get, I don't get it. <laughs> well, there are some tea drinkers. And then there's people that don't drink tea or coffee and then just drink water. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So 83% said, yes, I drink coffee. I mean, I think in the comments is kind of funny. I'll get there in just a second. And 17% said no. So so Brad, where are you on the spectrum? Uh, I am 100% Dunkin' iced coffee. I, uh, I've lived in Boston for over a decade, so it's it's kind of in the blood now. Well, and with 90 degrees, you kind of need the iced coffee, right? Like I'm on warm coffee because it's cold and snowing. <laughs> I love iced coffee too, but it's just not that. Hey, I'll, I'll drink it in a blizzard. It doesn't have to be warm. So, <laughs> well, there you go. Sage says, I'm allergic to coffee, so I drink energy drinks. <laughs> Interesting. And then everybody else is answering coffee, 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 
Coffee, coffee. And so actually, it's really funny because some of the comments, I'm going to read them. Um, Samuel says, in the supply chain industry, you drink gallons. <laughs> and Audrey, Audrey um, agreed with him on that. And then uh, Audrey says, specifically espresso, I'm in supply chain logistics and customs. It is often a triple shot kind of day. <laughs> Does everybody kind of agree with that? I mean, we're all in supply chain. We're all dealing with all sorts of disruptions and so many different things. Is it the coffee that kind of keeps you going? Brad? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a rough morning otherwise. <laughs> exactly. Jeffrey says tequila. I mean, <laughs> it's, for me, it's a little early, but I'm sure it's five o'clock somewhere. They're not mutually exclusive. You can do both. So. And Rhonda is in Arizona as well. And she says iced coffee is the key to the summer heat, but it's not even really summer yet. So I guess kind of the spring heat too. It's getting there. <laughs> and then Randy says, can't st start my day without coffee. Well, we had some um, really, really, really great ways um, or great comments from everybody on the LinkedIn <clears throat> poll so if you want to head over there and see a lot of people were cheeky like who doesn't drink coffee in supply chain i'm kind of on that team but i really usually only drink one coffee in the morning brad how do you how do you take your coffee because for me i put collagen powder in it i've got an espresso machine with a whole bunch of varieties of different nespressos that i can choose in the morning to try to figure out you know how i feel for the day and then i put some coconut milk in it Ice coffee and a little bit of cream. That's it. That's it. And yeah. how many of those do you have a day? I get one of these big boys in the morning, and then if it's a rough day, I'll, I might grab something around noon, like a smaller <laughs> one. Nice, nice, nice. I'm all about the chai tea in the afternoon. So I'll still get, or the green tea, I'll still get the caffeine that I need, but I won't go full on coffee unless I yeah. do one of those like espresso shots. No, nothing after like 2 p.m. Try to like give myself a hard, hard cut. I can't do it after 2 p.m. either. Or actually, it's 3 p.m. for me because otherwise I can't sleep. Yeah. Anyways. Oh, Rhonda says, I can't drink any after 12 p.m. or I won't sleep. See, we all have our different routines and our, our different thresholds. That's so funny. Well, thanks so much for everybody who commented on the uh, poll. I'm just going to go over to my personal LinkedIn as well. Let's Now, let's talk about – so yesterday, uh, we produced The Monthly Hustle, a new um, – a new, not episode, but a new edition of the Monthly Hustle, which is my personal LinkedIn newsletter. Uh, we've got 8,200 subscribers. And what we wanted to talk about this month specifically was, so you think you can podcast. I wanted to really give everybody in, a, in the community a bit of a insight into what it's like being a host, some tips and tricks of doing that, and then what it's like being a guest and some tips and tricks for that. I think one of them that I mentioned was smile. The other one I mentioned was being authentically you because it's really hard to, pre to, to pretend that, to be somebody that you're not. So Brad, as a guest on this show, I know you haven't read this uh, because I'm just sort of springing this on you right now, but as a guest on this show and a previous guest of other podcasts, what you know, what are some of the tips and tricks that you can give the community uh, to be part of it? Yeah, so I don't know. The, the last couple of live streams I've been on, you know, the response I've gotten from coworkers has been, you have the uh, face for radio and the voice for print. So I don't know exactly where to go from that. Um, so, but yeah, no, I think the smile, have fun, speak to what you know. Uh, and it's usually a pretty good conversation. It's, uh, yeah, don't try to do too much. And it generally turns out pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. So if anybody wants to go and check it out, it's over on my personal LinkedIn. I give some podcast hosting 101 tips and then how to start your own podcast tips and then uh, being a guest on a podcast as well. That one was really fun to do, really fun to write. I mean, you guys know I love what I do and podcasting has been a really big part of that over the last four years. And I've learned a lot. And I think that if you guys can learn from me and not make the same mistakes that I made that I had to get over, um, I think we can get some really cool and fun and amazing podcasts out there pretty quickly. So is there any podcasts other than Let's Talk Supply Chain that you like to listen to, Brad? Absolutely not. This is <laughs> the only thing I ever listen to. 
Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> want to say hi to Amy and Jerome over on my personal LinkedIn. Amy is talking about a mushroom-based caffeine alternative. I'm going to have to go and check that out. All right. So it's time for us to get into our supply chain topics. Now, we've got some pretty big ones to talk about today. So the first article is about the supply chain predictions of 2022 and the growing investment in delivery technology. Now, this article really talks about how technology can pair, can pair, can pair, not compare, can pair <laughs> with the technologies that are on the market to really um, be some key drivers in crisis. And so some of the key points that they make in this article is around consumer demand, supply chain bottlenecks, and the driver shortage. They're saying approximately 80,000, we are short 80,000 drivers. And so those are key crisis um, points that they're talking about in this article that we need technology to help um, mitigate some of the risks around those things. And so I'll talk a little bit, a bit about the technology that they're suggesting within this article, but I want to go to Brad first and just sort of talk to you a little bit about what you thought about this article. I mean, obviously you're working for a tech company that is in amongst some of these solutions that they're talking about. So talk to me about what this article meant for, for you and what you guys are talking about at Emerge. Yeah, so I think a lot of these things are, are exactly right. So the, the consumer demand uh, for on-demand and, and real-time delivery and predictability in delivery is something that's gonna become more pressing. I think a lot of consumers gave a pass to retailers in 2020 and 2021 because there was just so much chaos and this was unprecedented, but everybody's yeah. saying kind of buy now, figure it out. Like I ordered some furniture last year and it's, it took <laughs> six months to show up and it was fine. Right. Um, but in no circumstance would I do that again. Right. So anybody that's able to deliver on that has a massive competitive advantage against another retailer that can't. Um, the supply chain bottlenecks, I think, um, again, that ties into the same issue is that there's less forgiveness from consumers for people, for retailers not being able to figure it out by now. It's really tough. Um, it's a it's a hard demand to solve, uh, but I think it's ultimately one the retailers have to focus on. And then the driver shortages, um, that's very real. You know, unemployment as low as it is, um, it's not really going to go away unless freight were to dissipate, which I don't see happening in the immediate term. Um, at Emerge, we think about a lot of these in a couple different ways. The driver shortage in particular, I think, is something we can help with. And that if you think about the way Emerge works, we help link shippers and carriers you know, into a single marketplace where they can find better matching and more efficient freight movement. Yeah. A necessary output of that is that you have fewer wasted miles and more asset utilization for carriers, which means you're driver, you're getting more kind of actual activity per driver on the road. Um, so I think that's one real point where we can deliver a lot of value in this category. And then as far as being able to actually procure capacity inside your network um, and get shit and get goods shipped on time, um, shippers need a solution like Emerge to be able to kind of manage those capacity relationships in real time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a huge concern. I was I was surprised that we didn't really see capacity on that list. Like the driver shortage is one thing, but capacity is a whole other um, set of challenges, especially on the trucking side, even on the international side and things like that. It, the driver shortage conversation is a very interesting one because I've speak to some people that are like, yes, we have a driver shortage. And then I speak to other people and they're like, well, we need to pay them more and we need to treat them better. And so we'll have more people coming into the industry. And so there's a variety of different conversations that are having being had around the driver shortage. And I don't, and it, it's, it's interesting to see some of the solutions that are coming out there. And it's great to see that Emerge has that in mind with your solution, because I think it can be a really good profession, right? And there's a lot of freight to be moved. And so there's a lot of opportunity there. But going into the technology that they're talking about as solutions to solve some of these problems that they're talking about. So the first one is real-time transportation visibility. So and there's an acronym to it. There's, I mean, we've got acronyms to everything in supply chain. And so that one is RTTV, which I hadn't heard of before, but it means real-time transportation visibility. Now, visibility is also a conversation that we're having in a variety of different ways. And it means a variety of different things to a lot of people. One of the things that they honed in on here was the tracking component of the visibility um, within the supply chain. And so that's what they were focusing on with this real-time transportation visibility, right? What did you think of that one? Because I Yeah, I think the visibility is a necessary component for, for this 
industry to move forward. Um, and if you actually go back to the origins of Emerge, um, but it took you back five, seven years ago, um, there was a company called 10.4 Systems, which grew out of Global Trans. So to go way back in the, in the history of the, the founding story here, 10.4 um, Systems was built to be a real-time visibility software platform, uh, similar to what Project 44 or Four Kites is today. Um, and the concept was always not necessarily just to build a pure play visibility player, but that you needed that to enable the other half of the solution, which is the marketplace that allows for right. um, shippers and carriers to interact. And so the thought there was the reason that Uber, for example, revolutionized the way taxis worked. One of the leading reasons was that they had real time visibility where your car was. So yeah. you open up the app and the main screen was a map. Um, so you had trust in a network of a new carrier, you know, some guy in a car that you don't know. Um, to be able to use them for, you know, transportation, we thought the same thing was going to be true in, in, in full truckload and, you know, other types of, of freight. Um, and so the, the view is always that you needed to solve that problem first, and then you could have an enabled marketplace that people view as, as really important. Sure. So I think that the market is getting there on, on visibility. You know, there's that the ability to track loads in real time has grown in leaps and bounds over the past decade. We're not quite there yet, but I think that's where we're seeing some of the most rapid advancement. And that's unlocking a lot of things that the rest of the market does, like Emerge, uh, that allows for, you know, more dynamic matching. Yeah. And I mean, I had that situation with the taxi the other day. I think it was two weeks ago. The taxi was supposed to come at a certain time um, and they didn't show up. And I had no visibility to where he was mm -hmm. or when he was going to get here. And I'm standing out here in the cold waiting for him when I was like, I should have just used Uber because then you can see where the driver is, you know, when you need to step out of your house or wherever you are. So that's that's a really good example. So some of the other things that they talked about was AI and ML. So uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive intelligence, which is what Larry just said. And I waited to post Larry's comment because I knew I was going to say predictive intelligence. But Larry, you're spot on with predictability. Autonomous deliveries. I was just talking to somebody yesterday and they're starting to uh, work with Walmart on deliveries by autonomous vehicles, which is interesting. And then non-traditional fulfillment. So curbside, parcel lockers, drop shipping, pop-up stores, and dark stores. So just some of the things to consider coming out of this article. Um, if you want to go and check it out, we've put the article in the comments so that you can go and check it out. But it was a really, gr I thought it was a great article really talking about some of the key things that we need to focus on this year. So now the second one is a white paper from Emerge. And you guys uh, came together with Reuters for this particular white paper. Um, and you wanted to offer it to the Let's Talk Supply Chain audience because it's talking about enhancing relationships in logistics through data and collaboration. And obviously, especially here, we talk a lot about data. We talk a lot about collaboration. I was just at TPM in California. And the key message at TPM was relationships matter. So this is a very timely white paper to talk about. And then I had a conversation yesterday where they were like, we all talk about being connected, but we're not really connected. We're not really sharing data. And so how do we do that? And so um, there's a lot of conversations around this. So Brad, walk me through what this white paper is, why you did it. What are some of the key takeaways that people can um, are going to learn from this? Sure. Yeah. So there, there's smarter the people than me talking through the, the white paper, but I'll give you kind of the, the Cliff's Notes version here. Uh, and there's kind of two main points. And, and number one, <clears throat> you need to get actual use out of your data. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is a lot of what's happened in, in the transportation and logistics industry previously is there's a lot of unstructured kind of single purpose data um, that sits in a silo or doesn't even sit anywhere. Um, and so People and shippers in particular, and, and also carriers to a certain extent, lose a lot of the value that comes out of just monitoring and, and, and you know, utilizing the insights that come from their normal behavior. And so, um, you know, what we, what we would like to do with Emerge is kind of use those um, relationships that you have in your existing network. So the way that Emerge works, if you're a big shipper, you might have an existing relationship with, you know, a dozen carriers, a dozen brokers, and that's your existing transportation network. Um, and you might interact with them in an unstructured fashion. So I need a spot load next Tuesday. I might send an email and take the first best response I get. Right. That transaction is lost to history. So you as the shipper have no recollection in the future of kind of what the, the origin destination cost and the volume of bids you got back was. 
um, and you can't use that to behave intelligently again in the future. So all of that is kind of a workflow without a improving piece over time. So what we want to do is have all of that data move from spreadsheets and email um, into a software platform where you can kind of curate and build a real, more robust data set that can recommend smarter activities over time. So you talked about predictability as a, as a tech trend. Um, we think that's huge. So mm -hmm. knowing what to expect when you put something out to bid, knowing when to go to bid is really valuable um, if you're talking about an annual RFP for contract freight. Um, and so integrating all of that into the shipper behavior, I think, is really important. And the other piece is that, again, your network is important. So we are not trying to displace any of your existing vendor relationships. We think that's really important. You've spent a long time building them. Um, but it's probably short, it's, it's probably time to start mid, or, uh, moving that relationship into a more um, comprehensive platform. So if you were to think of it in a consumer context, it'd be like you have a group text of like 10 friends. And like we're building like a social network where like all of that activity can be centralized. Um, and you might find a couple new friends, you know, through our network. Um, and so I always love um, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're not just limited to your own small little universe forever um, is the way that we like to think about it. Well, and I think everybody, especially in supply chain, wants to not feel alone. And I think, you know, what you're talking about is obviously relationships matter, like I mentioned from TPM and how collaboration and data can really enhance some of those relationships and also give you the opportunity to find new ones as well, which I think is, is really, really important. So Jerome asked a, asked a question um, outside of this. Um, to solve partially U.S. driver shortage, why are there not so much double semi-trailer trucks on U.S. highways for long haul trips? Is it due to state regulations? Do you, can you answer that or no? I don't know. <laughs> well, okay. So Jerome, totally yeah. Jerome, we're going to take that question and we're going to, we'll send it to somebody else and we'll make sure that you get an answer. But that's a really, really good question. And uh, we'll definitely get an answer over to you. So let's talk about our third article. We only have what? We have less than, I think, just over three minutes to go. So this last one is about, uh, this one came from Frances Edmonds, uh, head of sustainability over at Dell. She sent it over to me. I love this article. We talk all the time about how procurement is so important to CSR initiatives. If you don't know what CSR means, it's corporate social responsibility. Um, and it's talking about how procurement can really lead the initiatives. One of the, um, the tech solutions from our first article did say to focus on sustainability. So the, the two are kind of co-related. Um, and so from this one, they actually surveyed 940 respondents. And so there's a lot of really, really great data in here. If you're a champion within your company looking to create some CSR opportunities, some focus on sustainability, if you're in an organization that's looking for ways to do it, this is a really, really great article for you because it comes um, with some of those stats and figures that you can present to your upper management or your leadership team. What did you think about this article before I get into some of the things that they were talking about? Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, and if you're talking about procurement just in the um, truckload lens, uh, which is our universe right now, in the, in the freight lens, um, yeah, I think a lot of people over procure, um, you know, without this kind of um, lens on what they're doing. So for example, if you were to go set up a bunch of dedicated lanes, if you're a big shipper and you're paying for the to and the from, you know, you're burning a lot of unnecessary gas to do that yes. just to have excess, you know, service levels uh, or service levels at a, you know, uh, threshold that you think is necessary. When in reality, if there were better matching in, in that entire uh, ecosystem, finding a backhaul so that you're actually having full uh, truckloads on both sides you know, you're, you're saving the environment and you're saving money through it. Um, and I think that is going to be really pronounced in this environment where gas prices are going through the roof. You know, there is a little bit of alignment now between, um, you know, CSR and, and ESG um, and just dollars and cents. Uh, whereas it used to be kind of a nice to have. Now it's absolutely a budget have to have. Um, yeah. So that, I think that's should be a tailwind for for this particular category. Absolutely. And so what they were saying was that companies with mature sustainability procurement, um, they have higher ROI, lower cost, increased sales, innovation, and lower risk. 
Um, and they said the most impact is actually made outside of their walls in their supply chains rather than inside. And um, procurement leaders are really the starting point. So they can make the most impact because what it means is they can actually work with their tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, get them on board with their sustainability program through their procurement efforts. And some of the solutions that they talked about was sustainability KPIs tied to performance. Um, invest in supplier collaboration platforms. So this is the first article where I've seen them actually say that the investment in technology can really help with a sustainability program um, that ties procurement and suppliers together, and then digitizing sustainability data. So really, really great article. It seems like a lot of sustainability programs can do really well with starting with procurement, and that procurement leaders could maybe start being that champion within their organization if they're not being part of that conversation yet or that conversation isn't being had. So thank you so much, everybody. Again, listen, we didn't end early this week. We actually went over and this has been an absolutely great episode. Brad, thank you so much for joining me as my guest today. Next week, Audrey Ross will be back and we've got some really, really good articles for you. So stay tuned, come back 10 a.m. Eastern next next Tuesday for some thoughts and some coffee and everybody have a great week. Thanks, Brad.